Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Facebook live stream. Uh, hearty welcome. Let's just open in prayer. Father God, we just want to thank you that your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And Father God, even this evening as we are discussing putting on the armor of God, Lord, I pray that you'd give us wisdom, give us insight, give us knowledge. And even as you have blessed us with a platform where we are able to share, even though we aren't physically together, Lord. Pray, Lord, that your know, Holy Spirit will take over, take control, and that we will just come out of this enriched, Lord, and prepared for battle. We thank you, Lord, for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Pardon. So, a bit out of my comfort zone, but God's got this. So, we were actually asked by our congregants if we would if we could have a teaching about equipping ourselves in the armor of God. Now, a lot of us have heard um, have heard of the armor of God, and we are familiar that it has your that it has various pieces or items as such. But how do we how do we go about equipping it? And it's such an interesting question, especially in the time that we currently find ourselves, where the world is honestly in a state of turmoil and panic with with COVID nineteen and lockdowns and everything and it's not just a national thing it's very much an international thing and it's exciting because if you think of it there's so much of this is actually times in with where the word tells us about the end times and things that will happen and that is most certainly i believe the case we are drawing closer and closer to that so <clears throat> putting on the armor of god really is it's a journey if you think about it so our our text where we read about the armor of God is in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Um, yes, let's start at verse 13, no, 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So we'll just stop there for now. So that's up to verse 17. Amen. So that is where, that is our original scripture where we learn about the armor of God. So it starts off with the belt of truth. So Why? Why truth first? So if we look at the original model, the armor of God was based on the Roman armor of the day, which was your strongest, was your best armor, was your strongest army, to my knowledge, but it was most certainly the best, the most well-equipped armor. So the belt of truth, you put it around your waist, and that really locked everything else in place. Okay? So... Without the belt of truth, you couldn't even put on the, the breastplate of righteousness, which is the next part, because it was linked, it was connected to the belt of truth. So if, you, if we have to start, if we look in John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Sorry, um, welcome all. Thank you very much. Yes, Pastor Chris, I agree. Please all, if you have questions, if you have comments on that, please do put it in the comments section so that we can so we can all share in it. And if there are questions, that we can bring them up and that we can have that conversation. Because it is cell group, after all, so it is very interactive. It's just a different platform that we're all used to. So, yeah, so Jesus said, here's the way, the truth, and the life. So in other words, if you are to put on the belt of truth, that means that you are to put on the truth, as in capital T, Jesus Christ. So let us look at truth in terms of our relationship. What is the truth? 
So your relationship with Jesus Christ, with God, what is it actually based upon? Is it based upon his truth? In other words, the word of God, where we find the truth? Is it based upon integrity? Or is it based upon, you know, a bit of a partial commitment here and there? Because we're going to get to that. We're going to get to what happens when you don't actually put on that full armor of God. When you don't put it on correctly, it, it makes us vulnerable. But let's not jump ahead just yet. Um, and this is what came, this is actually what came up last night in our teachers group as well. One of the points. So, for example, we are trying to live a kingdom life, a life in accordance with God's word. But, you know, we're hiding things. None of us are perfect by no stretch of the imagination. As was mentioned last night, if you were perfect, you'd be God. We are most certainly not God, so we are not perfect. But we strive towards the goal. We strive towards being more like him, as what is instructed in the Bible. Even Paul said that he is fighting the good fight. He is running that good race. So if, if your relationship isn't quite 100% there, if that truth isn't quite 100% there, then your belt isn't quite 100% attached. That's it's a scary thought, if we're honest, and it's a very sobering thought. Because at all times, where do we stand in terms of our truth? Are we standing in a place where we can say we are being truthful, <clears throat> where we are revealing things, where we are being frank with God, where we're having that one-on-one, -on -one, that honest line of communication? Or are we sort of holding back a little bit because, yeah, you know, this doesn't quite fit my agenda? Something to think about. Pardon. So a very good example of it is David. Now the word says that David was a man after God's own heart. Um, sorry, here's a, here's a question from Cassandra. Is the truth the word of the Bible? Well, if we look at that, Cassandra, um, my take on that would be the word of God is, is from God. So that is what he is teaching us. So I would say that that is his truth. Because Jesus is the truth, and the Bible teaches us about Jesus, teaches us about God, teaches us about his truth, about who he is, about who he is as a person, who his nature is. So you can just let me know if that, if you feel that that answers the question. And if somebody else also has a take on it, please feel free to add in. In the meantime, we'll just carry on while, we, while we're checking that. So <clears throat> if we look at David, like I said, he really poured out his heart before God. And God said that he's a man after his own heart. But have you really looked at the life of David? Because David was a man after God's own heart. And he had a very humble start. You know, he started as a shepherd boy tending his father's sheep. And we read that he had fought off a lion with his bare hands and a bear as well. That had come for the sheep. So he was strong. He was willing to protect. He was willing to lay down his life. That in itself should be ringing a bell about the good shepherd. So he had all of these. He had humble stars. He had total respect for God. And he followed God. But he still fell. He still committed sins. If you look at the life of David, you have lying. You have adultery. You have murder. And that is really, really sad. But it is reality, and it goes to show that nobody is above sinning. Not, it's not like, okay, now that we are saved, or now that we have the relationship with God, now we are good, we're never going to sin. Far from it. It's the same as Jesus said, that you will have trials in this world. We will also have temptations, because that is the nature of life. But as what was mentioned as well, there's, is, being tempted in itself is not a sin. It's when that temptation turns into action. When you start acting upon it, that is when the sin creeps in. Because Satan will tempt you. He will go for your weak spots. We will be tempted with various things because of our human nature. We cannot get away from the fact that we are human beings. But we are striving towards being more like Christ. We are striving towards having his character. So um, if you look at Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24, there are a few verses, so I will 
I know I have a tendency to maybe speak them a bit fast. So Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24. Amen, Pastor Chris, that is how we were born into this world. And David said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So you see, then David actually said to God, search my heart. In other words, reveal everything that is in there. Let me be truthful to you. Let me be open for you. And if you find something there that is offensive, lead me in the way everlasting. My interpretation of that, he, I mean, God, David even said to God to see his thoughts. So if he finds something there that shouldn't belong, help David along that way. And that really is a prayer that we ourselves should be praying. Yes, thank you, Philip. It is about the relationship David had with God. It was the relationship of honesty, truthfulness, and of integrity. See, integrity as well. Can you say that we have got a life of integrity, that our relationship with Christ is based upon integrity? That is a very important question. And once again, it's a sobering question that we need to ask ourselves. So an interesting thought and Let's let's see what, what you guys think. Why would David say to God to search his heart and know his thoughts? Yes, I gave my input, but why actually pray that pray pray that prayer? Why? There's a reasoning behind it. Let's just I'd like to hear what you guys think about that. So <clears throat> just to speak about the actual quality of a belt, of the belt of truth in, in terms of what it's, how it actually worked in the armor back in the day. You'll just have to pardon me with the tablet on the side. So it was a very broad equipment and it actually held five different kinds of swords. So you were fully equipped and it would be there ready for battle. Okay. And it was also... It also protected productive organs. And that is the next thing to think about. In terms of our spiritual walk, what are we reproducing in the spiritual realm? A few weeks ago, we spoke about being reproducing disciples in terms of, because sheep reproduce sheep in the natural world. And so it is as well in the spiritual world, in our Christian walk. We are there to make disciples of men. That is the Great Commission. So what are we pouring out? What are we producing? Are we producing from a place of truth? Are we producing from a place of integrity? Are we producing from a place of honesty? And that is something that I don't believe that we can just answer just at the, you know, at the drop of a hat. That is something that you really need to look inside yourself and really do some searching for and some thinking about. What am I producing? What, what is my truth? What is the seed that I'm planting? in others that I come across in my daily walk, in my ministry, what am I producing? <clears throat> so yes, that is a thought. So as I said as well, the, breast, um, the breastplate of righteousness was connected to the truth. So here's an answer from Pastor Chris. Just give me a moment, please. What comes to mind is the reincarnation, meaning person in whom a particular soul is believed to have been reborn. Um, what, what are you referring to the Apostle Chris? Sorry, I might just have missed that. If you wouldn't mind just elaborating on that one for me, please. I'd appreciate that. Thanks. So we will come back to that. So the breastplate of righteousness, as I said, it was connected, connected to the truth. And this ties in because... As we said, the first part of our journey is knowing the truth. So knowing God, knowing Christ, coming to salvation. Because the word says that you must confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. And that is that Jesus is Lord. And that is how you come. So it is an act of faith. It's an act of confession. It's an act of belief. Yes. Okay, sorry. I just want to pause here. I've got some answers coming in. I love this. Thanks, guys. Okay, Philip says... We need to ask God to search our hearts so that he can reveal the deep things in our own hearts to us through Holy Spirit. It is creating awareness of our hearts. 100%. I agree. I agree. Because if you look at it as well, Jesus said that when he goes, he leaves behind 
He goes so that the Comforter can come, the Holy Spirit, and he can dwell within us so that he can reveal these things to us. But God wants that active from outside. He wants us to ask. Cassandra says, I feel like search my heart is because sometimes it is so difficult to be able to verbalize what is on your heart. Sometimes not even you know how to explain your full heart's desires because they are too great to be able to put into words and even worse, put into action. Wow. I like that, Cassandra. Yes, 100%. It is because it is sometimes so difficult. Because as Philip pointed out, sometimes we aren't aware necessarily of all the things, but sometimes we just don't know how to explain. So we ask God, God, will you please intervene? I cannot do this on my own. I need you to step in here for me. 100%. I agree with that. Thank you, guys. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry. So we will come as we get these comments, we will go. So the order might be slightly out of sync, but I think we're getting the hang of this. Great. Okay, so breastplate of righteousness, as I said, was connected to your truth. So we know truth. In other words, we know Jesus. And when you come to salvation, the breastplate of, the breastplate of righteousness, if you look at the meaning of righteousness, righteousness means right standing with God. In other words, you're in a place of alignment. You're not sitting like this. You are like this. It's supposed to be straight. I'm not sure if the camera's getting it right. Okay, so you're in alignment with God. You're where you need to be. Yes, thank you, Pastor Louis. I believe it is then that we go to our inner room and ask Jesus to intercede for us. Amen and amen. 100%. Okay, so we, we stand in the place of righteousness. And the, the first thing that the, that the breastplate does is it protects the vital organs. Because it goes from your chest down, right? It's connected at the bottom to your belt, but it's coming up and it's protecting your vital organs. So what are some of the vital organs that it's protecting? The first one, and it's interesting, actually a few of us came up with this exact verse. And that is Proverbs 4 verse 23 that says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. You see, our, our heart is where the truth is, where things are really going on. And... Sorry, I'm struggling. I'm just trying to think of the right wording. Everything you do flows from it is what the verse says. So, you see, it turns into action. But if I have if I have negativity in my heart, or if I have hatred or bitterness, etc. in my heart, then my actions are going to be negative actions. They're going to be bitter actions. They are going to be hateful actions. Because it has crept in our heart. And... The New Testament as well speaks about a root of bitterness, that we need to be weary, that we do not allow the root of bitterness to take root within our hearts and to grow. What is, from Philip, what is coming to mind, the truth also allows us to have clear vision. Until you know the truth, you will not be able to see power, God's power in your life in its fullness. Amen. <clears throat> and that again, again, that ties in with the righteousness, because God's power needs to be there, that fullness, so we can walk into that full. And as well, when we started off, when we spoke about that 100% commitment, that 100% putting on the belt securely, because now if your belt of truth is not on securely, and your breastplate of righteousness is connected to your belt, that means that your breastplate is not on securely. So now your internal organs are not protected securely the way that they ought to be. So the one organ is our heart, and another is the lungs. So think from an obvious, from a physical perspective as well. If your heart stops beating, you are dead. There's just no getting around it. If it restarts, okay, great. But as well, let's say your heart stops beating for a while. It stops supplying oxygen to your brain. So God can do miracles. There have been cases where people's hearts have stopped, so they've been dead, they've come back, and they've been perfectly fine. And we know that that is God's miraculous power, and we thank him for that. But the reality is as well, is this, if the brain is starved with oxygen too long, then it starts to malfunction as such. There are deficits, there are cognitive deficits that you have, a common term brain, brain damage. So your lungs are also there, they supply the oxygen. And again, if your lungs are gone, if your air is gone, it means oxygen is gone, end result, you are dead. So once again, your righteousness, being in that right standing with God, so important so that your heart remains protected so that your oxygen remains protected that your kidneys that that 
you know, that, that um, filter out the impurities, that they are functioning as well. From Pastor Louis, um, Amanda said as well, she shared 2 Samuel 22, verse 2 to 3. Thank you so much. Amen. Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent men you save me. That is so, so true. Pastor Louis added, I'm thinking now sometimes our opinion is true to us. Yes, it is not necessarily the truth. Yes. Yes, that's actually another thing that came up as well is there's a difference between fact and truth. And when I first heard this, I thought to myself, are you sure fact is fact, truth is truth? Are they not the same? No. Why? The fact, for example, is somebody is lying sick in hospital. The truth is we are healed by the stripes of Jesus. You see how fact and truth can actually be two different things. Um, Vanessa, I'm just quickly reading here. So am I correct? God protects the whole man, physical, spiritually, and emotionally, 100%. I believe that 100%. And that is why, as well, I believe that Ephesians, it starts off when Paul starts speaking about the army, he says to put on the whole armor. Because as we are dealing with these various aspects, we are going to find that it covers us physically, spiritually, pardon me. <coughs> Sorry, I just need to grab water. And emotionally. From Philip, breastplate is keeping your heart in place position, keeping it as pure as possible. Exactly. Thank you, 100%. Um, Luke chapter 6, verse 45. And this actually ties in 100% with that as well. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the, for the, pardon, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. That is so true. Let's, let's get real for a second. It's all good and well. You know, when, when things are going great, when things are being smooth, then it's, you know, it's easy to stay positive, it's easy to stay upbeat, and everything is where it needs to be. What happens when the pressure starts getting applied? What happens when, you know, something or someone really starts to push your buttons? You know, when you start just speaking without thinking. And there's where Proverbs says, and where this also comes in, pardon, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I know that I myself have fallen into that trap, into that trap as well. Then you find yourself under pressure, and you know what? Then the right thing to say or the polite thing to say doesn't always come to mind first. Then you just speak, and then once you've calmed down, you have to reflect and you have to think. Okay, so the test came. How did I respond? What came out of my mouth? If it wasn't good, then we need to start. Then we need to go back. We need to start examining this thing. What is in our heart? Because why did this come out? The word tells me that my heart is full of it. That is what my mouth speaks. From Pastor Louis. With a breastplate, the enemy wants to make our hearts impure. When we apply the breastplate, we need to pray the protection of our hearts and for our hearts to remain pure. Amen. Exactly. Because that is part of what this is about. Sorry, I sort of lost track here for a second as well because we're speaking about what they are but how do we apply it so we apply the truth by coming to know jesus we apply the breastplate by praying for that protection to keep our hearts pure to keep our organs functioning to keep them protected as vanessa said god protects us physically spiritually and emotionally all three of those facets come into play with the armor of god Amen. <clears throat> and then another point that came up is that righteousness is a gift from God and it is also our identity. So think about it. We are born with who we are. You have a name. The name can change. Either we change it, maybe we get married. There are various ways. But your identity remains the same. When I got married, my name changed, my surname changed. But I still remember, remained who I am. I still remain Calvin. You, when you get married, you still remain who you are. But who are you? Do, you? do we understand who our identity is? 
Because, for example, are you basing your identity on what the world says your identity is? Or are you basing it on righteousness? Are you basing your identity on who God says you are? Where God says that you are my child and I've called you by name. When God says that you are my child and I'll look out for you, that you do not need to worry about tomorrow, that you are co-heir with Jesus Christ. These are scriptures that you are co-heir with Jesus Christ. Think about that for a second. That is your identity. That is who you are. Your identity is not determined by the balance of your bank account or the success or failure of your job status or who people say you are or curses and negative things that have been spoken over you, that have been spoken to break you down. That is not your identity. Your identity is who God says you are. Um, yes, and thank you. Sorry, I was just quickly checking the notes here. Our identity is what sets us apart from others. Thank you, Vanessa. Yes, who are you believing the truth about? Very, very good point. Who are you believing? Are you believing what others say? Or are you believing what God has to say about you? The next part of the armor is the preparation of the gospel of peace. So why doesn't it just say, <clears throat> yes, thank you, Vanessa. Exactly. Do we believe the word of God or do we believe other people? So why doesn't it just say the gospel of peace, the shoes, the sandals, depending on your translation, but depending on translation as well, it will say the, the preparedness, preparation, or the readiness of the gospel of peace. Why? Because you need to be ready to go out and to spread that gospel. Because now you've come to know the truth, you've come to know righteousness, so you know identity. So now we are to go out and we are to spread it. But how are you to spread it? You are to spread it from a place of peace. So just, just the physical um, aspect of it, of the shoes as well. If you recall, when we started reading Ephesians, there are a couple of times that Paul says to stand firm. So the way that the sandals were designed as well is that nails were actually driven into the bottom of them and then the heads of the nails cut off. So it effectively made spikes. So those spikes, you could dig into the ground and that could help the soldier to stand firm. Because think of rugby togs and soccer togs and all the rest of it, but think, yeah, sharper and pointier really at the end of the day. But that is why we are able to stand firm with that. Sorry, and it also means that we are to stand firm in a place of peace. So, um, yes, Anja Skepers, something important to remember is that our perception influences our truth. We should pray that we see the actual truth without twisting it to fit our own desired outcomes. 100%, 100%. We need to have that clarity. We need to have the discernment of Holy Spirit to understand us. Amen. So, if you are in a place of peace, if you are, if you are in a storm, you know, and the winds that are blowing, you might want to fall around or not even if you want to, but if a wind is so strong that it can actually pick you up and move you over, or if something comes and it knocks you, if you are standing firmly, if you are grounded in, like with the sandals, that's what we have just discussed, what we have just described, that helps you to have that extra standing firm. So you won't just be tossed backwards and forward. So when troubles come, when turmoils come, when the world comes to bring disruption into your life, when it comes to bring negative things and painful things, we can stand in peace because God has given us the equipment to remain in his peace. Peace is not only found when you're sitting beside a still stream. It is found as well in the midst of a storm, but when your eyes are focused on Jesus Christ, that is when we find our peace. So that is how we equip our peace, by getting to know the one who gives peace. One of the names of Jesus given in Isaiah is Prince of Peace. So we have to ask ourselves, do we know the Prince of Peace? And if we look at the steps of the armor, yes, we've come to know the truth. We've come to know Jesus. Therefore, we do know the Prince of Peace who gives us this peace. And the armor it's not just about myself and to protect myself, it's about mobilizing. So yes, it's to give me peace, but as we said, it's to go out and to spread that gospel. 
you are not given the gospel just to stand still and look pretty. If that was the case, then really the moment you got saved, God would take you straight into heaven. And then there wouldn't be anybody to preach the gospel further because but that's why the Great Commission is there. We are all called out to go out and to spread the word, to spread the gospel. And we need to pray that the peace is contagious. I can think of an individual that I know. And when, I'm, when, you, when you are with this person, immediately there's just a sense of peace. And it is exactly that. It is contagious. This person, the best way that I can describe it is that they have a gift of peace. And I love being in the presence because that peace is there. But also, do we choose... If we find the peace, if we are given that peace, do we take the peace? Or do we say, okay, there's peace, but I'm going to choose to go towards the, tor towards the turmoil. From Cassandra, if you do not stand firm in peace, even though you may, you may have the purest intentions, you might not be able to spread the gospel with full effect when an attack comes. Oh, yes, exactly. Who are we in the midst of the storm? Who are we then? That is when our identity really comes to the forefront. And Philip as well, when you are at peace with God's purpose for your life, his peace will mobilize you to spread the gospel of peace, the Great Commission. Amen. And it was also pointed out that the peace of God ties in with evangelism, right? Because we are going out to spread the gospel, but we are to do so in a place of peace. So from the, from the place of um, now we have the shoes of peace, the preparation to spread the gospel of peace. A very important part that comes up next is the shield of faith. So just to quickly give a description of the shield, because it really ties in with the different points that we're going to, that we're going to look at from the shield. So the shield covered you from head to toe. It was literally that big. So in other words, the soldiers could kneel behind it and then they would be protected, their whole bodies. Because now they're wearing the helmet, they're wearing everything, but they've got this massive shield. So shield is great. We can do it. So if you're kneeling behind the shield, what are you doing? You're kneeling. So you're actually in the perfect position for prayer and surrender. Because that is where, that is where we get to know God. That is where we get to spend our time with him in prayer when we surrender ourselves. A few weeks ago, we've been speaking about supplication as well. In other words, giving up my will entirely and saying, God, let, my, let your will become my will. Let your desire become my desire. So when I pray, I'm praying your will into effect, not my will. I'm praying your desires because my desires are the same as yours. We share the same desire. The way that the Father does not want anybody to go lost, I must not want anybody to go lost. Ties them with evangelism, with peace. But that is what it means to, to really, to a supplication, to be in prayer. And a very true thing that was mentioned as well is that as we fight our battles. We fight our battles on our knees. Because battles, yes, there are physical things that we have to deal with. There are going to be physical encounters. But we need, we must also remember that the word says that our, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the spiritual realm, but it's against the powers and principalities. And that means that we need spiritual weapons. We need to be praying against that. Thank you, Kathleen. Humble ourselves in front of God. That is exactly what it's about. It's about humbling yourself, about forgetting who you are. Not forgetting in the sense of your identity, but rather putting yourself aside is a better way to say it. And say, God, I'm here. I'm here in front of you. And a very beautiful thing about the shield is, um, I just want to see if I did write down the refuge, um, the verse, apologies. Uh, okay, I didn't have it. But um, so we, we know that the word says that we are not to forget, forsake the gathering of the saints, right? Um, yes, sorry from Cassandra. Faith comes in with trust. Amen. So the word teaches us not to forsake the gathering of the saints. So yes, that means, for example, coming together for cell groups, coming together for prayer meetings, coming together for praise and worship, coming together to church to hear the message, to hear the word of God, to get spiritual food. We are not to forsake that. Why? Because we get together. 
So now if you have the shield of faith, one shield can protect one person. But the interesting thing is if the shields could actually interlock. So they started to form a formation. But the only way to form a formation, you would need more people in order to form that formation, right? Now you have the shield and you can really protect yourselves all around it. So one shield protects one person. Two shields protect two people. The more together, the stronger that formation is, the stronger that protection is. And they could actually form a formation in such a sense that there would almost be like a hollow in the middle. So if there were injured people, those injured people could come behind, could be in that hollow, could be protected by the shield, by, by that wall, if you will, of faith, by that wall of shields, while they are healing, while they are getting stronger. So when I say that, by no means am I saying that if we are injured, if we are in need of prayer, if we are in need of healing, that we are weak or that we have lost our faith. That is not the case. But the fact of the matter is that all of us go through trials and tribulations. We all have got our moments where we need the support of others. And that is why we have a body of Christ. It's not called the cell of Christ. It's not called the molecule of Christ. It's called the body. It's made up of many members. Pastor Louis says, if we bow before God, we will be able to stand in front of anyone or anything. Amen. I really like that. Yes, for Pastor Chris, unity for the body of Christ, for we are warriors in battle. Exactly. And that is what we are. So your faith is stronger as you get to know other people. So back to our original question, how do we apply the shield? Of, how do we put on the armor? So how are you going to, to put on the shield of faith? And I have, a, I have a thought on that, but I'd like to see in the comments, what do you guys think? What do you believe is a way that we can really equip ourselves in terms of actually equipping the shield, getting it ready, getting it in position? How do we go about equipping it? So the shield, while, we, while we're discussing that, so the shield was there as well to quench the fiery darts of the enemy, right? That is, a, that is what the scripture says as well. So sometimes we can see the darts coming. We can see the arrows coming. So if you have your shield equipped, you can block it. Great. Sometimes you do not have it ready in front of you because maybe you're fighting the battle there or fighting here, or you're just not looking in the direction where that projectile is coming from. And that is where the unity is so important because if I'm fighting alongside my brother and my sister, they can see that attack maybe that I'm missing. And they can say, hey, heads up. Here, quickly, I'm going to bring my big shield and I'm going to help protect both of us. Okay, from Philip says, growth in faith comes from hearing and sharing our faith. Yes, I like that. From Vanessa, must discern the tactics of the enemy so that we know how to protect ourselves. Exactly. Yes. You see, these fiery darts, these arrows, sometimes we'll see them as arrows because we would know how to recognize them. But if you do not know the works of the enemy, you might not be able to discern that these are arrows that are actually coming your way. Yes. And as well from Pastor Louis, as we discussed also in our group, feed your faith and starve your doubts and fear. Yes. Johan, if you do this, God will direct you. You'll be able to endure, and all these people will also go to their place in peace. Yes, I like it. Exactly. So there, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that ties in. Do not forsake the gathering of the saints. That means church. It means prayer meetings. It means prayers and worship seasons, sessions. It means cell groups. But it can also mean just getting together with another believer and sharing your faith. You see, the thing is, the shields were, were comprised of the same material. They were the same design. That is why they could interlock. interlock. But now, for example, if you are from a different, going with a different army, what happens if your shield is designed to interlock and the other person has a round shield? That round shield cannot interlock. You cannot form that formation together. Yes, from Pastor Chris, know the word of God and know how the enemy works. Yes, Kathleen. Power in the name of Jesus, Satan trembling, hearing his name. Yes, and your shield, call out to Jesus. Amen. Right, so, so we interlock. So in other words, we need to get to people that are the same faith, that have that same belief, that have their relationship with Jesus Christ. A very, very important thing, and I believe that this is one of the keys, 
is that faith refers to our faith with God. It does not refer to a denomination. It does not mean that if I belong to church A and they belong to church B, that we have we serve the same God, we have the same beliefs, but we're not the same church, that we cannot interlock our shores, that we cannot get together. That is not the case. It says of the same faith. So that means that we need to be breaching these gaps. We need to be breaking down the silos, these barriers that we as people have allowed to be put in place, that we have helped put in place ourselves. Another important thing is it does not mean that it has to be the person that has the same level of faith as you. Because some people are newer in Christ, so they, they still have a longer journey to go, where the others have already been working a long journey. So they're a seasoned soldier. Think of a new recruit versus a general. They're on the same army, but they are different. They have different skill sets because this one has got more practice. He has got more exposure. He's got more leadership skills. So you can get together with other people that have the same faith, but it does not mean that you have to be on the same level because that is how we grow. We rub shoulders, as we like to say, right? We teach one another. We grow one another. But here is a challenge to the Christians, to the generals, that we've just discussed to those who are higher up in the ranks if you will just in terms of them having walked a longer walk with god so if a baby christian if somebody who is new to the faith comes to the church comes there to look for somebody to lock shields with to grow their faith with but you are not there how are they going to lock their shields how are they going to grow their faith with some of the same faith if you are not present so you see, it doesn't mean, okay, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I can quote Genesis to Revelations and then the concordance as well, if you'd like. That does not mean that I've made it or that I've arrived. It doesn't mean that I no longer need food. I need to be there both to grow myself, but to also to help grow others. Thank you. Yes, Galatians 3, we are all one in Christ. Amen. There is no Greek, no Greek, no Jew, no Gentile. Okay, so we as Christians, you need we need to show up there for one another to help one another grow in faith to help one another fight these battles but as we discussed earlier these you know if you're injured if your arm is injured and you need some time to heal but you are in the middle of a war because the fact is we're in the middle of a war 24 7 whether we know it or not whether we like it or not but if you are injured and somebody cannot see that you're injured they cannot help protect you so if you're injured you need to be able to reach out to others who are able to help you. So if your faith is failing at this moment, then you can reach out to brother or sister and you can say, you know what? I'm weak. I'm having this struggle. Something has happened and my faith is shaky. I'm really struggling at the moment. Can you please assist me? Can I come and can you help shield me? Can you help treat my wound? Can you help protect me? Doesn't mean that I'm not going to do my part. But it means that I understand that we are a body and therefore I can come to you, my brother. I can come to you, my sister, and I can say, stand with me in faith that we can get through this together. Amen. Be available, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Yes, that is so, so true. That really is true. It doesn't help you pitch up at the church building and you don't speak to anyone. And yeah, I'm also guilty here because... Believe it or not, I have I have my times where really I'm shy when it comes to being introduced to new people and intermingling with people that I don't know. I quickly develop a comfort zone and then I want to stay with the people that I know. But that's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to mingle. I'm called to grow with others so that I can learn from them and that they can learn from me. That we can rub shoulders together, that we can form this formation with our shields from birth. If you want to grow up, show up. Yes, Chris as well, Pastor Chris, you need to show up from Johannes. But you, our Lord, are a shield about me. You are the glory and the lifter of my head. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that is why that shield is so important. That faith is important. Hebrews also teaches us that without faith it is impossible to please God. So I hope that we are that that we are all each of us are really grasping the importance of faith the importance of having that shield up but the actual faith itself <clears throat>
Okay, and then so another few few questions that came up, a few points. How do we put on our shield of faith, right? So let's quickly summarize as somebody we really love likes to teach us, and I really love it when she says it. So how do we put on our shield of faith? By testifying, by gathering others who are strong in the faith as well. Because the more we grow in faith, the more faith we will have. Amen? You kneel behind the shield. You fight your battle on your knees. You must link shields with people of the same faith. Faith comes by hearing and word of God. Share your faith. And another point, yes. When you share your faith, not only are you helping grow someone else's, but you're actually helping to grow your own. I don't know if you've experienced it as well, but sometimes when you talk and you talk about things that have gone past or you're testifying about things that have happened, sometimes we start to forget the details because these things have happened further back. And then suddenly it's mind is like, oh, I've been through that. Now I remember God carried me through this. He taught me through this. I was in a place where I thought there's no way out. Here I stand today. That means that I could get through. So my testimony encourages others and encourages myself. From Pastor Chris, wow, when and how often do you need to apply the armor? That one, I would like to see the comments. I would like to hear myself. What do, what do we all think? Because I don't believe that there's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything further. I'm going to watch the comments for that. Thanks, guys. Love this. This is good interaction. Let's, let's hear when and how do you need to apply the armor? Another point that came here as well up last night. Newborn Christians may not be ready to share their faith as yet. They still need to grow. Yes, because maybe they, they need to grow confidence. They need to grow. A baby, when a baby is born, you don't just put a baby and say, hey, go walk, go feed yourself, go change yourself. You, you need to be there to help to protect the baby, to nurture that baby, right? But what they can know is that the Lord hears their prayer. They pray behind their shields. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 says, Call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Pastor that I know says, used to say, it was a student's prayer. Call unto me, and I'll show you things you do not have the foggiest clue about. Okay? So if you do not know, God says, call to me, I will show you. So you say, God, how do I grow my faith? How do I apply my faith? Call on him. He will tell you. He will share you. Okay, some answers are coming in here. Faith sharing and faith strengthening comes from rubbing shoulders fellow believers from Philip. Yes. Oh, Pastor Chris, you are asking the tough questions this evening. I hope those aren't all aimed at me. <laughs> How do we explain to another believer the importance of applying the armor? Okay, so that's another good question. In answer to the previous question of how often do we apply the armor, all day and every day, from Vanessa. Thank you, Johan. I think you need to apply the armor 24-7. Cassandra, I think that when you walk true, when you pardon, let me start again. I think that when you truly walk with Jesus, you walk constantly with your armor intact. It is what you wear every day. Yes. See, there's the key. Are we staying in a place of righteousness? Are we keeping our armor in check? Are we keeping it in place? Are we keeping it clean? Are we keeping it functioning? Pastor Louis says, we need to remember that in this battle, Satan would want to shoot arrows of doubt regarding God's, God's truth. It is here that our shield being the faith hold on to the word of God, even if it doesn't make sense. Exactly. Faith is not about understanding. Faith is not about knowing. The very the um, Hebrews chapter 11, um, it's either verse 1 or verse 6, I believe, I stand under correction, I apologize, but it is in Hebrews 11. Which says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So that there is a definition of faith, as Pastor Louis has rightfully pointed out. Faith means, I do not know it. It's the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. Same way God Unless we've had encounters, we've had physical revelations, but we know that God is there even though we can't see him because that's faith. That faith is what gets us to that point. So while these questions are coming in, and please do not forget that question that Pastor Chris asked, how do we explain to another believer the importance of applying the armor? Let's get those, let's get those answers in, guys. Let's get those thoughts in. This is great. Sword of the Spirit. So the word of God is about discernment, right? Because you need to know the enemy and when he comes, as, as was mentioned earlier. I believe it was Vanessa who mentioned it as well. 
Asana, I think it was. But yes, so we need to know that and we really need to know those attacks when they're coming. But the word of God, I like to say, you cannot teach what you do not know. Because how can I share the gospel? How can I share my faith, my shoes of peace, my gospel, right? The truth, knowing Jesus. How can I share the word of God if I do not know what is in the word of God? In other words, I need to actually spend time with God. I need to spend time in his word. I need to spend time to get to know the character of who God is. I need to know what has God said? What has he left behind in his writings? For me as instruction today, when the Bible was written all those thousands of years ago, what did God feel was so important, was so imperative to put into his word that I can use it in my day-to-day -day being today more than 2,000 years later? Because it is true, it is in there. So the word of God is the sword of the Spirit, and that is our offensive weapon. So if, you've, if we've listened to the rest of the armor, all of those are defensive items, right? This is our one item that actually attacks. So this is the one thing that you hit back with. You hit back with the word. So yes, we can say, if we know the reference, for example, if I can say, okay, Genesis 1 verse 3 says X. Fantastic. That is really good. But if I do not know that Genesis 9 verse 7 says this, but I, I know what it says, I just don't know where it's found, it doesn't mean that I can't use it. The greatest example of this, and my personal belief, is that this is the reason why it, was, why it was also included in the Bible. When Jesus was tempted by Satan himself in the desert, what did Jesus answer Satan? He didn't say, in the scrolls, in the Pentateuch, in the books of, in the law of Moses, da, 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 da. He said, Satan, it is written. And then he said. So you just need to know, what does the Bible say? You need to believe in what the Bible says. And then you say, it is written. The Bible says this. The Bible says that I'm a child of God. The Bible says that I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the top and not the bottom. I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. I'm a co-heir with Christ. It says that I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. It says that Psalm 91 verse 11, if I know the verse great, that the angels will come to protect me. Or I just know that the Bible says that God will protect me. He loves me so much. He says that he has loved me with everlasting love. That the word says that he has known me before I was in my mother's womb. Before I was conceived, he knew exactly who I was. He formed me and he destined me. These are things, these are just some of the things that are in the word of God. But if we are spending time in the word, if we are spending time with fellow believers where they are sharing the word, maybe they are sharing scriptures that we haven't found yet, then we aren't going to know what's in our word. We are not going to know our weapon. Because you see, you cannot go into battle, you cannot go into war with an untrusted weapon. You cannot go to war with something that you do not know how to use. Because chances are you're going to hurt yourself or you're not going to be able to protect yourself when you need to be protected. You're not going to be able to attack back. Because while you are studying, trying to figure out how do I take the sword out of a sheath, here comes the enemy with his sword and he stabs you. Because you do not know what does the sword work with. How does it work? Or you know what, the sword is so rusty, when I'm trying to take it out of the sheath, I can't take it out. So, bam, I'm dead. I'm spiritually wounded, and it's going to take me months, weeks, etc., to recover because this wound is so deep, so severe. Once again, I'm not saying that if we get wounded, it means that we do not know our word or that we do not have faith. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we need to know our armor because it is there to protect us. We need to know how to apply it. So when the answer comes, we can protect ourselves. Some answers are coming through. Yes, thank you, Pastor Louis. This is what we used to fight back, the word of God in context, 100%. It does not matter, it does not help you just know what the word says if you do not know the context of it. You need to know when God said this, what did he mean by it? When he said that I will give you this and this and this. Okay, great, these are promises, but look in context. For example, tithing is a godly principle. You need to tithe in order to, in order to receive because the word says, Bring this into my storehouse. Test me in this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven. Context is key. Yes. I love it. 
God's word from Philip, the helmet of salvation, yes, is the protection tool of our mind. 100%. Cassandra, Satan used a Bible scripture. I love this. However, Jesus knew of a higher truth. Exactly. You see, Satan also knew Psalm 91 verse 11. Satan said to Jesus, God said that he will not let your foot strike a stone. The angels will protect you. What did Jesus say? It is written, you will not tempt the Lord your God. So Satan knew the scriptures, because make no mistake, he knows the Bible back to front. But he also knows how to rip it completely out of context. Question is, do you understand the word in context? So when something comes along where the, where the Bible's being taken out of context, that you can say, no, 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 it actually means this. And how do we get to know the word in context? Spend, spend time on the word, as we said before, but also we rely on Holy Spirit to teach us these things because the Holy Spirit reveals it so that this revelation builds up in our hearts. Amen. Ah, a very good point as well that came up. You must discern so that you fight the right fight and not get caught up fighting the wrong battles. I know that we've said it a couple of times, but it is so, so true. So often we get caught up fighting the wrong thing. We get caught up in a symptom instead of the actual root, instead of the actual cause. And therein lies the problem. We need to address the right thing. We need to address the battle that we need to be fighting. In other words, the spiritual powers that the word warns us against. That is where our focus needs to be. It does not need to be on the person who has said something or done something that has hurt me or offended me. It doesn't mean that they are right by what they have said. They have done. They have said something wrong. But now am I going to go back? Am I going to attack the person? Or am I going to understand that this is yet another tactic, as we said earlier about knowing, the, knowing your enemy, that this is a tactic that he is bringing in order to take my focus away from God, in order to take my focus away from the battle that I need to be fighting, and, fight, and now I'm fighting the person who is not actually, that's not what I'm being called to do. I'm being called to spread the gospel. Psalm 119, verse 105. I'm not going to read the whole Psalm 119. If you feel so, you may are welcome to in your own time. There are a lot of precious jewels in there. I'm just going to quickly focus on two of them. So verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Verse 11 of the same psalm says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Okay, so guys, can we take a second? Can you see how the one relates to the other? I have hidden your word in my heart. When we were speaking about the breastplate of righteousness that protects our vital organs, the way Proverbs says, guard your heart. Where you have hide your word in your heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you've hidden God's word in your heart, you're going to speak in God's word. That is what that is what needs to be in our heart. That is what needs to be coming out of our mouths. <clears throat> Yes, from Yohan, Yohan, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. Amen. Okay, uh, yes. And here is here's another guide, and it's actually something as well that applies to teachers, where in James 5 it says specifically that we will be held more accountable. Because you see, the point is, you need to understand the truth. You need to know your word. You need to know the sword if you are going to effectively communicate it. Why? Because you might encounter people who do not know the word, and you might be the only person that they hear actually mentioning the word, and they might not have access to a Bible. Maybe they cannot read. Maybe they forget the reference. So they hear, but they remember your words. So if you misquote scripture, or if you quote it out of context, they might believe that as truth. And then we are actually deceiving others, whether we know it or not. So we need to be very careful. And that is why, again, it is so important to know your word. So that you know that you are sharing the right thing. That you are sharing it accurately and in context. So that you do not lead others astray on purpose or by accident. And then what I really... Um, can have I missed the helmet of salvation? I feel like I've missed the helmet of salvation.
I think I have. Can somebody confirm? <laughs> oh goodness, I lost it in my notes. Ah, okay, well, I'm going to touch on the helmet observation. So apologies that it's not in the right order, but maybe it's for a reason. <laughs> Thanks guys, I've got the confirmation. Okay, so let's quickly go to the helmet. A very good example of the helmet observation where its importance, where its importance comes in is in 1 Samuel chapter 17. <laughs> Love you guys. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And that is where we have Goliath standing against the Israelites. So if you look at it, they had been staying there for a while. Goliath was intimidating in stature because he was seven foot tall. So yes, he was an intimidating giant. But he was attacking them psychologically. Before they even went out in battle, he was taunting them. And he was mocking them. And they were allowing themselves to be mocked. It was a psychological assault. So your salvation, yeah, love you too, thanks. <laughs> so your salvation, right, that gift from God, we, do not, we cannot doubt it. God's word is there. So we need to know that our salvation is secure. Because the Satan, the reason why we also need truth, is because Satan comes and he ceases to sow doubt into it. He ceases to sow unbelief into our minds. So we start to doubt, we think, am I really saved? And the moment we start questioning that, all of our other functions start to get out of place. Because now, can I put on the breastplate of righteousness if I do not have salvation? I'm going to think about this. So while I'm sitting thinking about this, bam, there comes the enemy, arrow to the heart. Because I didn't put in my breastplate, because I wasn't confident in my salvation, because I allowed the devil to sow doubt. Okay, so it's there to protect us. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, so you need to transform your mind. And I believe it is Paul as well. He says, when I, was, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child. But now that I'm a man, I act as a man, I think as a man. So think of it from a spiritual context. When you're a child spiritually, you act like a child spiritually. So you need milk. You cannot give a child steak. They're going to love it, hopefully, depending on... Okay, let's not go there. The point is, you cannot give it solids. It needs milk until it can grow, until it can actually have that, right? And that's the same way. So our minds, we start off thinking baby steps, and then later on we start thinking mature, because now we understand the word more, we know our equipment more. Just to quickly check the comments, just bear with me a moment, please. Bartholomew. Oh, yes, there's the answer to Pastor Chris's question earlier. To explain the importance to another would be for the other person to understand that the enemy we are battling is not always something we can see. Yes, the attacks aren't always on the outside, but a lot of times on the inside. It starts in our minds and hearts, 100%, 100%. So if we need to explain to someone why it's important to put armor, for this exact reason. Because anybody, whether they are Christian or not, understand, will understand the thing about self-doubt. Because at some point you will have had some self-doubt. There's a good chance that as well, some people have had self-loathing. They've got self-esteem issues and, 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 and. And these are all things that are internal, right? These are all things that are in your mind. So if you have the helmet of salvation, your salvation knowing that I have a home in Christ, then I am protected from this. So thank you for that. Yes, thank you, Johan. You said um, the, that verse. Yes. Okay. And it's to protect the sanity of God's people. Amen. 100%. And there's another key as well. And if we look in Philippians 4 verse 8, I really believe that this is such an important scripture. And I myself need to remind myself about the scripture many times. And it says, finally, brothers and sisters. So everybody is included, right? Cool. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Philippians 4 verse 8. 
So you see, that ties in with Romans 12 verse 2. How do you transform your mind? By thinking on these things, by not thinking on the wrong things. And that is how so, so salvation, God's word, protects our minds, protects us from these things, protects us from the psychological assaults, so that we do not end up that we curl into a corner and we can no longer fight because we are so traumatized. From Philip, the enemy wants you to doubt your salvation in Christ. As soon as you doubt your salvation are distracted, you cannot be effective in the kingdom. Exactly. Exactly. Because you see, there's nothing that Satan wants more than to have us not be effective in the kingdom. From Bartholomew. Helmet of salvation. If I understand correctly, we need to have some kind of assurance of our salvation. We need to think and believe we are saved. Yes, exactly. So you need to know the word. You need to believe the word. And you see how this links in with faith. Because you need to have faith. Because the word says that I'm saved. So I must trust that the word says that I'm saved. I can look around me. I can see God's work. I can see his miracles. I can read through the Bible. I can read about the miracles that happened even in the Old Testament. I can read about the miracles in the New Testament. I can read it right across the spectrum. And I can see God's faithfulness and God's power coming into play every step of the way. And then, as we were discussing all of this, teacher Cindy was in the group, and I love it. She said something, and I thought, wow, it is so true. So we, we've had this whole discussion on the armor, right? And it's important. It's important to understand because, you see, as people, we are visual people. We like to, we need to look at things. We like to understand it. If I, saw, if I say to you, a sword of faith, in your mind, you see, okay, this is a sword. I use it to attack. Sword of the Spirit. Great. A shield of faith. Okay, shield protects me. Faith. Got it. But let's not lose sight of the actual elements themselves. So, do not forget about the fact that we have got... Sorry, I'm just going to quickly get to the right place here. If you'll bear with me just a moment. So, do not forget that you have truth. Okay? Do not forget that you have righteousness. Do not forget that you have peace, a peace that passes all understanding. Do not forget that you have faith. Do not forget that you have salvation. And do not forget that you have the sword of the Spirit. It is important that we understand these things in their context as well. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. Know that you have faith that when God says something, His promises are yes and amen. Again, it's in the Bible. It's there. His promises are yes, because God said it. Amen. Amen means let it be so. So if it's in Bible, I agree with it. Amen. I stand upon it. I confirm that. So yes. There we go. Sword of the Spirit. Let me have that faith. The word says faith as a mustard seed. A mustard seed doesn't think, oh, can I turn into a tree? Can I grow into a tree? No. Put the seed in the right Place, put in the soil, give it what it needs, let it germinate. It will grow up to be a mighty mustard tree. So that is how faith is. You just need that little, little bit. And it's not necessarily about the size, but again, that's a visual thing. It says faith as a mustard seed. A mustard seed does not doubt that it will become a mighty tree. The seed will become a tree. That's that, because that is what it was destined for. And that's the same with us. We have been destined, we have been called to be children of God, to have salvation, and to go out and to spread the gospel. Just read a comment here from Cassandra. Think of this flu that is going around at the moment. It is not only a silent killer, but it is contagious. If you do not wear your protection to keep you from picking the germ, picking up the germ, you will get attacked. The same with the armor. If you do not equip yourself, it is easy for you to catch the thoughts of feeling or doubt of the enemy attack. And then even worse, let it fester and grow to the point where you are spreading that illness, illness, ill will, and attack to others. Amen. You see, exactly the same way we said that we want our peace to be contagious, that our faith grows amongst others. That's the thing. With the attack, those things are also contagious. You need to be protected because the onslaughts will come. Jesus promised us. He said, in this world, you will have trials and tribulations. But he leaves us with a promise. The promise said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So the fact that, pardon, the fact that we have trials and tribulations, that's not the end result. We know that there's one who has already conquered it from the beginning of time. 
Apostle Lewis says, I'm thinking of the sword for a moment. And if the people of God do not spend time on the word of God, then we will stand with a butter knife instead of a sword. Yes, exactly. So that's part of knowing your equipment. Are you picking up a sword or are you picking up a butter knife? Both of them have flat surfaces, but they serve two very, very different functions. They fulfill two very different roles. Okay, you see, the, the elements that we're discussing, the truth, the faith, etc., that is what the enemy wants to steal from us because then we cannot equip ourselves. Because then we're ill-equipped, then we're not prepared. The Ephesians says, put on the whole armor of God. It doesn't say, put on truth and run. It says, put on truth, put on breastplate of righteousness, put on salvation, put on faith, put on peace, grab your sword, go. The whole armor. We need to dig into the word so we can discern what we are sharing with the other people. Amen. So I hope that this was informative. I know that I personally got a lot from us as we were discussing this as a group and really learning from this and Holy Spirit revealing things. And I do not believe that this is the end of it. Amen. I believe that as it continues to be in time of the word, as we have said the importance thereof, he will continue to reveal things to us. We will continue to learn more things. So if there aren't any more questions, then I think I'm going to close off in prayer. Okay, from Johanna, we must remember that the Lord will never put something on our path that he knows we cannot handle. He will make a way with his way. Exactly. The word says, no temptation has come that, that um, he does not know of. Amen. Kathleen, Jesus also said it is done. We have to believe and have faith in his word. Yes, 100%. Vanessa, Paul says that we have done everything. Pray. Yes, we must pray. Amen. It's important because that's our line of communication with God. We have an open line of communication. And remember, it's not a one-way thing. It's a two-way thing. As we speak with God, he answers and he comes back to us. Amen. Let's close off in prayer. Holy Father, we want to thank you for your presence. We want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for your beloved armor, your precious armor that you have given to us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that it is not given to us without restriction or with terms or conditions, Lord, but that you give it to us to equip us so we will not go and we do not know what to do, Father God. But that we are protected, that we can attack and that we can defend ourselves and we can spread the gospel and do all of these things that you have called us to do. We do not do it in our name, Father, but that we do it in yours. Holy Spirit, I pray that you be the after preacher, Lord, that you would let things take root in our hearts, Lord. That as we go forth, that we will remember these things, Father, that it will become a reality, that it will become a relation to us, that we can apply it in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just one thought that came up to me as I was going, and that is, if you think about it briefly, quickly, when somebody comes to salvation, do you, re do you realize that they, are actually, that they are actually covered in the armor? Because they have come to know the truth, Jesus, by faith, the shield that has given them the salvation, their helmet, they have that peace that passes all understanding. And often they are eager to go out and spread the word, so gospel of peace. So I think those were the four, yes. So the thing is, and they, but the thing that they do not know is the word. They do not know the full power of it. And that's why they need to spend time in that. They need to spend time in that word. And we are responsible to help our others also get to know the word more. Amen. I see that there's a prayer request from Brian. Brian, um, if you'd like to share the request on here, you can. Alternatively as well, you can um, post it on the info group if you feel comfortable. Otherwise, failing that, please do feel free to send us a direct message as well. Um, we can pop a mail or you can WhatsApp one of us and we will go through from there. Amen. Be blessed all, and we will see you again soon. Please remember to keep an eye out on our page. We will be live again um, at the latest on Sunday. Amen. God bless.